اهلا بحضراتكم في حلقه جديده من حلقات اوكسجين توك شو في تساؤلات في الفتره اللي فاتت على الاقتصاد في كندا بنلاقي ان في تغيرات حصلت فيه كتير والتغيرات دي قلقانه شويه وبتطرح شويه تساؤلات الويجز اللي ارتفعت بسطت ناس لكن في نفس الوقت في اصحاب البزنس واصحاب الاشغال بيكون عندهم مشاكل وفي بعض الناس مشوهم الانترست ريت بتاعه البنوك التاكسز حاجات كتيره بتتغير في بعض الشركات بتقفل في بعض الشركات بتعمل انفستمنت احنا كنيو ايميجرانتس عندنا تساؤلات ده احسن وقت نعمل فيه الانفستمنتس والمشاريع بتاعتنا ولا بيكون نستنى شويه السؤال اللي بيطرح المهم هل الاقتصاد الكندي في بومينج ويتحسن ولا داخلين على ريسيشن ونستنى شويه في الاستثمارات معانا النهارده ضيف هام جدا وهو خبير اقتصادي هيجاوب لنا على كل الاسئله دي وي هاف ذا بليجر تو انترفيو توداي ديفيد فويتشيك is an expert in economic and business environment and the president and CEO of Mississauga Board of Trade and one of the key players in affecting the economic and business environment. Uh, Mississauga Board of Trade uh, considered as uh, the voice of the businesses, not only in Mississauga, but uh, in Canada, Canada-wide. And uh, it have many committees in which uh, analyze and evaluate the performance uh, of business environment. Thank you very much, David, and welcome to Oxygen Talk Show. Great, Ramey. Thanks very much for having me. It's good to be here. Thank you very much. Actually, let me start with uh, some of the media reports about our uh, Canadian economic performance. Sure. Uh, we have some reports say that the Canadian economy is one of the fastest a growing uh, economies and the fastest ever in the G7. We have other uh, say that um, our GDP is increasing 1.7 in the third quarter of 2017 and this is a good uh, numbers mm -hmm. for our economy. On the other side, some of the economists say that uh, don't be so optimistic about this. This is have a price <laughs> and we have a high debit for uh, many years. Other they say that will affect uh, our uh, employment rates or unemployment rates on the future. Um, some asking, uh, or the main question, where is our economy is going? Is going for a boom or a recession? <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever you have, uh, whenever you can find uh, all the economists to agree on one, uh, on one uh, uh, answer, then you will have a utopian uh, universe yeah, because they, there, there's always uh, contrary opinions. Uh, when uh, with economists because they they take a certain amount of data they analyze it uh, for uh, for you know for various purposes so it's not uncommon to have economists that have uh, controversial or opposing uh, opinions um, our economy is tied to the US economy we there we cannot get away from that so when the when the US economy is doing well then the Canadian economy will do well and when the U.S. economy is not doing well, uh, we uh, follow suit. So, as as some people say, you know, when the when the U.S. Uh, when the U.S. catches a cold, Canada gets the flu. So, <laughs> so with uh, with the economy and some recent numbers came out in the U.S. that the that their uh, last quarter uh, drove just under three percent uh, economic growth within the U.S. Uh, there's no question about it that there has been uh, some great economic growth in the United States. And, uh, and so consequently, Canada is enjoying uh, part of that economic growth as well. Um, with respect to, to debt, debt's always, always a concern for, um, uh, for business people anyways. Uh, depend, depending upon which government is in power and what the economic conditions are, uh, the governments will employ debt to do to, for a stimulus. Um, I think what some economists are, are confused at right now and, and, uh, uh, and some business people are confused about with what the, the federal finance minister and the prime minister are doing is they are, they are increasing our, our spending and increasing our debt when we are, are in good economic conditions. And those two things just they generally don't go together. Generally, you'll increase debt when you're not in good economic yes. conditions to stimulate the growth. So that's a little, uh, it's an anomaly that is, uh, is questionable right now. 
Okay, so you said that uh, our uh, economy is related to by or another <coughs> to the uh, U.S. economy, but actually the commercial relation is a little bit uh, on a sensitive stages. We have some negotiations yeah. with USA about the NAFTA, which is a commercial and trade agreements between three countries, Canada and Mexico and USA. And now it's um, actually many of um, the reporters and media uh, say that uh, it is not going into uh, a good way. So how do you think that still we are uh, have a good uh, economy numbers and the uh, commercial relation with uh, USA is not stable uh, according to NAFTA? Uh, the, the NAFTA agreement uh, was always in jeopardy because President Trump doesn't like trilateral agreements. He likes bilateral agree agreements. And of course NAFTA being a trilateral lateral agreement is one that he does not favor. The, uh, the difference between Mexico and Canada with relationship with the relationship to the US and trade is that um, the U.S. has a deficit with Mexico, so Mexico is in a better position as opposed to Canada, the U.S. has a surplus with Canada. So the, 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 the economic condition between Canada and the U.S. and Mexico and the U.S. is different. And so what the president really wants to do is, is he wants to balance out that trade uh, surplus deficit with countries uh, that, uh, that have the U.S. at a disadvantage. China is a perfect example as well. So China uh, is, uh, is in that position and Mexico is in that position. So while, while the president wants to blow up NAFTA, um, uh, some people have suggested he wants to blow it up as a trilateral agreement, then he'll go back to the negotiation table and he will set up two separate agreements, one with Mexico and one with Canada, and make those bilateral agreements. So this means that it is, um, it is uh, the, the relation between the economy, the U.S. and the Canadian economy is the same and the trade relations will be the same uh, but with different uh, names of agreement. I, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say it will be the same. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, the president uh, of the United States is very much a protectionist. Yeah. Um, he is, uh, there was a, a news show on uh, earlier today and they were talking about where he's taking trade relations and some people have suggested he's taking trade relations back to pre-World War II uh, eras where uh, you know, Hoover was the president then and, and he was very much a protectionist as well. Um, the, the way the, the world works right now, a protectionist uh, society can survive, but it may not thrive uh, in, uh, in, in, in not engaging in global trade, or at least in, in some sort of global free trade. Okay, so um, uh, and if we have um, a kind of sum up for the Canadian economy, this is... Uh, would be a challenge or maybe an, an opportunity or at least keeping the same performance? Well, there's certainly an opportunity to, when you go back to the table to uh, maybe negotiate some things that, uh, that were not in your favor uh, yeah. in the past. Um, Trump, Trump is a fierce negotiator. His, his team are fierce negotiators. And, uh, and, and with, you know, with certain items, they are negotiating from a position of strength. Uh, I, th I think what, what our negotiators do are pointing out to, to the U.S. Uh, and something that either President Trump uh, doesn't know or just refuses to acknowledge is that there are millions and millions of Americans that will lose their jobs if NAFTA is scrapped 100%. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he wants that on his resume uh, at, the, at the end of his four years when he has to go back in for a, a second term. Uh, I, th I think that uh, they, will, they'll, they will quickly realize that, 
that the uh, that this will be detrimental. If if the whole agreement is scrapped, it will be detrimental to to both countries. And what about the current Canadian government? Are they performing well in understanding this uh, changing the dynamic variables? They uh, they react well and they do the uh, a good policies in which we enhance our Canadian economy. <clears throat> Uh, with respect to NAFTA, yes. So with respect to NAFTA, I, th I think the Canadian team is 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 doing uh, they're doing everything they can under the circumstances. Uh, certainly, uh, Andrew Shear and uh, and his team went down to Washington to uh, uh, to uh, give their position on on NAFTA. Of course, they're not the the prevailing government at the time, so uh, I'm not sure uh, you know how they were received, but uh, certainly they were received. Um, a lot of businesses are are uh, are talking to their U.S. counterparts to perhaps put pressure on the administration to to understand what the effect is on these companies that are that that have have uh, offices and factories on both sides of the border. Of course, the automotive industry is it will be affected by any any uh, change in NAFTA. So I think given given the the climate. Uh, I believe the Canadian negotiating team is, uh, they're, they're doing the best job they can under the circumstances. Well, that's great, uh, and it's uh, really, uh, uh, I noted that you, uh, you mentioned the Andrew Shear, the opposition leader, and uh, not mm -hmm. the government, but anyway, they are Canadian at the, at the end, and they're working for the sake of Canada. Absolutely. Uh, my point of, uh, uh, of view, if you go to more, um, more into the details of the economy and what happened on January 1st and especially with Ontario with increasing wages, <laughs> minimum wages, mm -hmm. I mean to 14. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, should be a good news for many, um, how can we say, entry level uh, jobs. However, some of them they, uh, received bad news that they are out. So let me uh, know what's your uh, uh, technical comment about um, Raising the, way, the minimum wages to 14 and the second year 2019 will be 15 per hour. First of all, the business community was uh, was supportive of raising the minimum wage. Right. What the business community said was that it was too much, too fast. Uh, raising uh, uh, raising the minimum wage by 22 percent uh, in a very very short period of time did not give business enough time to react to uh, to the ramifications of of such an increase. Uh, so by the time uh, January 2019 rolls around, we'll be closer to 32% increase in the minimum wage. Now, I don't know too many businesses anywhere that can absorb a 32% wage increase 
in such a short period of time. So that was our position with the, with the provincial government, is to say it's too much too fast, bring it in at a dollar a year over five years, give business an opportunity to effect efficiencies, give business an opportunity to absorb some of the costs, give business an opportunity to increase their prices to their uh, customer base in order uh, to um, uh, in, in order f to increase the minimum wage for people. The, uh, the other issue that business had is that the, the government did no evidentiary uh, disclosure of, of the economic impact to Ontario. Their, their own financial accountability office said that it would cost Ontario 50,000 jobs. Uh, the, uh, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce and Chambers of Commerce across the province uh, did a uh, commission to study that, uh, that showed the economic uh, impact. Uh, so it was the only study that was done. Um, no, at no, the, the minimum wage came out of left field. I mean, that, that wasn't, that was, we've been following that file for a year and a half before it was actually enacted. And at, at no time was minimum wage ever on the, ever on the table. So that came as a complete surprise and shock. And some have suggested it was a reaction to the NDP's uh, leader, Andrea Horvath, saying that she was going to increase minimum wage. So, um, the minim and the minimum wage was, that was just one component of Bill 148. It, it really took away focus on a lot of the other uh, dramatic changes uh, for business in Bill 148. Okay, let me comment uh, two things. One mm -hmm. about uh, the dramatic change in even in prices after the wage increase, in which in Ontario uh, there was an uh, inflation rate increased uh, over the rate of uh, increasing wages by 0.7. So inflation overall cannibalize this increase, but uh, make uh, the payments for these workers less because of uh, the rate of inflation. Uh, the other thing, uh, I know that Mississauga Board of Trades has a lot of uh, efforts uh, in negotiating, uh, negotiating about one Bill 148. So can you let me know some of these efforts? Uh, well, <coughs> we, uh, we certainly held a number of, uh, of town halls. We interviewed uh, business owners to get their take on what the impact to their business would be uh, with, the, uh, with the implementation of Bill 148. Uh, we, uh, we fought uh, hard through the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we had a number of ministers uh, come to address the Mississauga Board of Trade and its members. And, uh, and uh, the last one was the Minister of Finance, Charles Souza. And uh, we asked uh, the minister some really tough questions. Uh, he, was, uh, he was very eloquent, as, as the minister always is. And he, did a, uh, he, answered, he answered some of them uh, candidly. Uh, but uh, you know, a lot of them he did a, a very nice uh, pivot, <laughs> that, that, pivot great. on. Yeah. And and uh, and so he was doing his job. But it, in asking the questions, asking the tough questions, we let him know that that this was not going to be good for for business. So once once the minimum wage went up, and by the way, a, a minimum the with a minimum wage. In economic terms, it's a false floor. And every economic model that you look at that shows a false floor, a false floor, all it does is it moves economic um, uh, value from one group of people to another group of people. So people will lose, some people will lose their jobs, and other people will en end up with more money to spend. So this idea of pitting one class of Ontarian against another class of Ontarian is uh, it's it's not a desirable political position to take, so so we have a problem with that. Uh, we had a problem with uh, with things like scheduling. We had a problem with uh, uh, with uh, um, a mandatory increase in uh, in vacation in vacation entitlement. There were a lot of these other items that will add to the cost of doing business. And when it all boils down, every business is going to need to increase their prices. And so where are we going to be in a year, two years, three years? 
this minimum wage increase is now going to be gobbled up by inflation and the people and everybody will be back in the same position. And we haven't even discussed, we don't even have numbers on the economic impact of wage creep. And I mean, what I mean by that is if, if you were making $20 an hour and the minimum wage moves up 22%, are you going to still be happy at $20 an hour? The simple answer is, well, no, you won't be happy at $20 an hour. You're going to want an increase from $20 to $22 or $23. And the persons at 25 will want to go to 28 and so on and so forth. So this uh, notion that an increase in minimum wage will elevate um, people that are at the poverty level to a place where they can afford things is uh, that notion and that, uh, that idea is, is severely misplaced. Okay, so you think that the people that are um, minimum wage, inc uh, they increase their minimum wage, wouldn't be happy because of the inflation rate? Well, I, I think on the surface, people will be happy about it. Yeah. But let's take a, a, a real look at what that means. First of all, if you look at the people that are making minimum wage, uh, I believe the number was 56% of the people making minimum wage mm -hmm. are, are uh, living or a son, a daughter, or a family member living with family. So what does that mean? That's youth. So these young people that have these jobs working at McDonald's and Tim Hortons and, and Dollar Store and all these places that pay minimum wage, what these businesses have to react in some way if they can't raise their prices fast enough yeah. that means they have to cut down on their labor content because yeah. labor's huge in those businesses yeah. so that means that that uh, these young people these these the youth the the ones that that the the premier has said were the most vulnerable are going to end up losing their job so how does that help uh, anyone uh, the statistics showed that there were only, and I believe it was about 8%, only 8% of the Ontario population earning minimum wage are the, primary, uh, are the primary income earners in a family. All the other ones were secondary income earners, they were students, they were seniors, uh, you know, supplementing income, doing something so they could fill their time. So it, what the, when, when, the, when the provincial government said that this was supposed to fight poverty, poverty is a completely different uh, topic and, and you, you don't fight poverty by raising the minimum wage.
there are uh, frequent closing for many big names, uh, for example, uh, Sears, Sears uh, Target, Target, Futures. Yeah. yeah. So I just wonder, it is uh, um, individual cases or economy reasons, economic reasons. Well, I think first of all, we need to look at where these closures take, what sector of the of business these closures take place mm -hmm. in, and these closures take place in uh, in the retail uh, market. Yeah. Um, and then we also have to take a look at why did these closures take place. Uh, if you take a target, um, uh, many many experts in the retail market have said that Target just did not understand the Canadian market. So for those Canadians that were going south of the border to go to a Target store, the Target store they were visiting in Buffalo was not the Target store they saw when yeah. it came north of the border. Yeah. And, uh, and so consequently, um, consumers went into Target expecting to do one thing, and they ended up with something completely different. So that was a... Uh, you know, that was a tactical error on Target's part when they came across the border into, into Canada. And, and we also have to realize, I mean, that, that, that the stores like Walmart and the other big retailers that are in Canada, they weren't just going to let them come across the border and, and, and capture market. I mean, they were going to fight back yeah. in some way, shape, or form. So, um, so that was, uh, you know, the situation with Target. Um, Sears... Uh, Sears just did not change with the times, and uh, and and Sears has remained Sears for uh, for for decades and decades, and uh, and they just didn't seem to be able to uh, to keep up with the other retailers in their sector in order to keep market share or gain market share. Uh, the other uh, really important part that we have to think about in the retail sector is people are shopping differently now. Uh, People, a lot of people are shopping online now. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, how do these retailers react to online shopping? You know, did they keep up with the times? Did they have what people were looking for online, uh, or were they, fi you know, were they competitive in pricing, competitive in delivery? I mean, all of these things in the online shopping world are are really starting to take an effect on the on the retail market. So. There's a, it was a combination of, uh, of, of things with, uh, with Target and Sears in particular. Yeah, so it's individual reasons has nothing to do with the economic uh, growth uh, of uh, Canada. No, and, don't believe uh, so. On the other side, I think uh, Staples and many other uh, companies react that uh, they will close some physical locations mm -hmm. and begin to depend more online. So yes. that makes sense. Uh, my, uh, my last question in this uh, part, what this? Uh, what are the conclusions for investors? You know, um, in the Middle Eastern community, a lot of new immigrants, a lot of people, b a businessmen, and a lot of people think in making projects. So, is it uh, a good time to make uh, projects or investments? I mean, start a business. Yes, it's always good. It's always <laughs> a great time to start a business. <laughs> yeah, but uh, sometimes people would like to, uh, would prefer a better economic conditions. I, I don't know that <laughs> I don't know that you can get much better economic conditions yeah. than right now. Are there certain uncertainties? Uh, yes, I mean there's uncertain, but there's always going to be uncertainties at any point in time. Um, I think what people need to need to do if they want to start a business is they they measure the economic climate because we we always have to remember that even in a recession, there are businesses that make money in a recession because their businesses are programmed yeah. to make money in a recession. So it just depends on what your business model is. Yes. So if, you're, if you are watching the, econo the uh, economic conditions and, and the economic growth uh, in the U.S. and in Canada, if you're watching that closely and, and there's no leading indicators to suggest that the economy is going to take a, a downturn, which there are no there are no leading indicators right now that suggest that we are headed for a downturn. Yeah. Uh, this is a good sign. It's a good sign. Yeah. Uh, this is a long run of economic growth. I mean, this has been going on since 2009. Yeah. It's a very, very long stretch. You know, normally we go in those seven-year cycles. Yeah. So you think about that. We're at nine years with still good growth on the horizon. 
So I think if people watch those leading indicators and their business model is built uh, for those leading indicators, then there's no reason why they should be concerned to start and invest. Uh, what are the, uh, the, best, uh, uh, the best industries to invest in Canada? Ooh, that's uh, a, uh, the, uh, best, the best businesses. Um, uh, I wish I had hindsight on this one. I think I could make a lot of consulting money if I, yeah. if I had the perfect <laughs> answer perfect answer for this. Uh, I think certainly anything that has to do with uh, with an aging population, uh, those businesses are certainly booming. So uh, businesses that are around home health care, uh, businesses that are uh, uh, that uh, supply services uh, to to people uh, that are getting older that uh, you know that baby boom generation that that uh, that generation uh, they have a little money to uh, to uh, to spend. Yeah. Uh, they want to stay in their homes longer, uh, but they don't want to have to do the, the maintenance work. So, you know, those companies that are in grass cutting and shrubs and painting and, and uh, renovations, uh, um, any, any kind of Mr. Fix-It uh, kind of business, uh, anything that will, that will help an aging population is still a, a strong area to get into. And that's it. And the amazing answer. That's uh, really a build on, on a lot of uh, experiences. I know. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you very much, uh, David, for this My and uh, for this interview. We really appreciate uh, this time, and we uh, will meet again in the second part of the interview. My pleasure, Ramy. Thank you. Mm -hmm.